loving Lord Jesus, this song that we sang where we just declared your goodness and your power and your greatness, that you are for us and with you nobody can stand against us, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be strengthened and encouraged, that we would live into this life of freedom and joy, and that we would not, we would not approach fear as the same way that we used to. And that we would look out at all of these problems in the world and we would look at them with you at our side. Bless us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So um, this is prob- that for some of us, this is going to be a, a low-hanging question. So if you could pick one basketball team in Washington State to represent our state, our people in basketball, which one would you choose? Gonzaga. Gonzaga, exactly. Now, I I bring that up for a very specific reason, and that is is that, um, so in Jesus' day, there was a group of religious people, Jews, and And if there was one group that the Jewish people would say, let them represent us in religion, it would be the Pharisees. Now, if you're if you're newer, you know, to as far as just studying the Bible and stuff, you may not have even yet heard of the Pharisees. But they were a specific religious sect within uh, first century Judaism in the days of Jesus. Now, if all you ever read were the Gospels and you didn't have any other historical help, you would be shocked. Uh, And and nobody would blame you if you were absolutely shocked that the Pharisees were like the the religious elites. Because Jesus, some of, really Jesus' harshest words were towards them. But the Pharisees were rigorous, devout, they were God-fearing. They, they knew their Bibles. They were admired by most Jews. If, I, I, if you were to take a poll of people in, in, in Judea, in Israel, at the time of Jesus, and say, who should be our representatives with God? They would have pointed to the Pharisees. There was another group of Jews who lived mostly in Jerusalem, And they were known as the Herodians. They were not known as being religious. They were known as being political. Um, They were part of a dynastic mixed Jewish blood. They favored Roman occupation. They favored taxation. They got their power and wealth by being in cahoots against the average Jewish person by supporting Rome. The Pharisees and the Herodians were natural enemies. And then Jesus came along. And Jesus had a peculiar knack of frustrating evil and those who practiced it. Now, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be celebrating um, Palm Sunday. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. It is a prophetic symbol saying that he is the true Prince of Peace. Um, It was a sign to the people that this is the coming of the Messiah, if it's really true. And when Jesus did that, he united together the Pharisees and the Herodians. They both saw Jesus as a bigger problem, and even though they were enemies, since Jesus was a bigger threat, they decided that they would go together, try to trap and destroy him. They sent a combined delegation that had Herodians, and you'll actually find this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this same story. And Matthew is the one who tells us that they they sent this delegation with some Herodians and some Pharisees, but the Pharisees were young. Probably on purpose, where the older Pharisees thought, okay, we're going to send these, you know, pretty much young, maybe a little naive, very idealistic, devout believers with the sincerity that they're going to try to destroy Jesus. Now, they had a plan. They're going to start by flattering him. And if you go and you read the story, you will find that they said all these nice things about him. And then they ask him this question. 
Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, this question was devilishly clever. If Jesus answered no, he would be branded a traitor to Caesar. And they could turn him into authorities and then they could do what they do with traitors. If he answered yes, the Jews would say he's not on God's side, he's unpatriotic. No matter what he said, they were certain it would spell his doom. And then what happens next is absolutely brilliant. Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? This is Jesus speaking back to them. He knows what's going on. He knows perfectly well knows what's going on. And he knows that in their heart, they are plotting evil. If you were here last week, we were talking about this. As followers of Jesus Christ, we will never use evil. If we use evil, we've been overcome by evil. We're committed to good. You hypocrites. Show me the coin for the tax. Now, most likely, they had to receive a coin from somewhere else. Because this coin for this tax was printed by the Romans, minted, stamped. The Jews did not like having coins with human images on them. It seemed to be going against what God's word said. And they especially didn't like coins that had idols on them. And they were in the outer temple courts... And so they would have avoided bringing anything like that with them. And so he says, where's this coin? And so they probably had to go retrieve one. Now, picture this. Jesus is there. There's excitement. This is after the triumphal entry. He's been teaching in the temple courts. There's crowds of people who are really wondering who he is. And now, here are the super religious, really great Pharisees with the Herodians. And then they come and ask Jesus this question. And this question matters to everybody. You know, it's like, what's your position on masks? And Jesus says, okay, bring me the coin. Now, here is a picture of that coin. This is is the one that they most likely brought to Jesus. It was a silver denarius. And on one side was an image of Tiberius Caesar. Now, you can see this on the slide. On the other side is um, the goddess of peace of Rome. Now, what is stamped on the one side with the image of Tiberius Caesar are the words, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, Augustus, because he has now this same title of being Augustus, but he is the son of, and this is, and the claim was, is that Caesar had become a god, and Tiberius is the son of a god. Who claims to be the son of God? Jesus. On the other side, you have the image of the goddess of peace because Rome claimed to establish peace for the world. And then it said that he was the high priest for this goddess. Um, Now, they had this coin. And if you're a devout Jew who believes in scripture, it's suspect that you have this coin. But they had this coin. Jesus didn't. They were soling themselves with the image of an idol made by human hands. They were holding on to something that had the audacious claim that Tiberius is a son of God. Now, most likely at this point, there's a bunch of Israel loyalists who were cheering though the young Pharisees who were typically on the side of the Israel loyalists were probably squirming. And then Jesus says this. So, give back to Caesar 
the things that are Caesar's, and to God, what is God's. And with a single sentence, Jesus not only says, let the idolaters have back their godless image, but he also claims that human governments are legitimate, but with God-prescribed limits. Caesar was the Roman Empire's largest benefactor. He oversaw their military, bureaucracy, public works, and state religion. Caesar demanded tribute and tax. And Jesus said, give him the things that belong to him. It was not a kind and gentle government. Estimates are Jewish citizens at that time had to pay 50% of their income they're mostly agricultural, back in taxes. There was not tax brackets. This is what all of you have to do. You struggled to make ends meet. This was an agrarian society, very susceptible to droughts and famines. And you are going to have years where there are children who end up starving and that you will not be able to feed them because of the taxes of Rome. And what does Jesus say? Give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. We follow God. We who follow God should give back to these fallen powers that which belongs to them. But we, every one of us, including Caesar, should give back to God what is God's. There is a proper domain and function for human government. Jesus is affirming that reality. It's not the only place that you will find this in the biblical scriptures, but here is Jesus talking about it. And yet, at the same time, God has stamped his own image on every human being. Intellect, will, soul, strength, all these bear the divine stamp. So go ahead and give to the king, the state, the tyrant, the elected official, that which is theirs. But the actual person belongs to God. And every one of us should give to God the things that belong to God. That coin was from the mint of the Roman Empire. And pressed on it were claims and values of that empire. The empire determines its use and value. But you are from God's mint. He has impressed upon you his image. And he makes his claims. Jesus is the true son of God. Jesus is our true high priest. Jesus is the one who actually establishes peace. And God has proclaimed his values. Love God, love people according to the truth revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus' sentence here is the single most important political statement ever made. Now, we are in Romans 13... And we are coming to the place where Paul is giving instructions to the Christians about how to live in the world. And Romans 13, 1 through 7 is basically Paul's exposition of what Jesus said. Give on to Caesar what is Caesar and give on to God's what is God. A little bit of background as we prepare to hear what Paul specifically says. Paul was writing to a divided church. There was some division between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Paul was trying to impress upon them the reality that God was creating one new people, Jew and Gentile alike. These little divisions that are between you. Let's work through it. Let's come together. Let's claim our higher unity. Paul was writing to a church facing a hostile culture. They were right in the heart of the empire's capital, this small little community of Jesus followers who were holding on to claims that there is one true God and his son is Jesus Christ and he is the only savior of the world and he is the only one who can bring true peace to the world, which are all claims that are counter-empire and are in direct opposition to Rome. And it was a superstitious, it was a suspicious culture. And it often would look at problems and look for a religious explanation. And when you had a small group of people who weren't worshiping what everybody else was worshiping, that would be the problem. It was dangerous. 
Finally, Paul was writing to a church that lived through a specific event that they knew could repeat itself. Our best guess is that about in 49 AD, the Emperor Claudius has expelled all the Jews from the capital of Rome, causing many of the Jews to lose their homes, their livelihood. Now, this is interesting for us as Christians. According to the Roman historian Suetonius, the, the cause of the uprising was an inter-Jewish dispute centered around a religious person whose name sounded like Crestus. He didn't quite hear Christ correctly. Now, that same issue of Jews attacking other Jews because they were actually Christians or Jews attacking any followers of Jesus will continue. Paul's fully aware of this. He's fully aware that there are some Jews who are going after him trying to create problems. This is a pressure-filled situation talking about what for most people was a tyrannical government that used blood and crosses to get people to follow its way. And Paul, fully aware of all of these things, is writing to these Christians living in the capital of the empire, trying to help them know how to live for Jesus in the world, even with their enemies, because Jesus says, I want you to love your enemies. Not being overcome by evil, but overcoming evil with good. And so this is what Paul writes. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against this authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no, hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also a matter of conscience. And what he's saying there is, is, this, is what you're, this is what God is calling you to do. Verse 6, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. Sound familiar? This is expounding what Jesus said. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. His overall message is quite simple. I want you all to be good citizens. Even though we don't believe in other gods, and we don't believe that Caesar is the son of God or the savior of the world, we believe that his government Every government is where it is under God's power and authority. Therefore, it is our duty to be law-abiding citizens. And I want you to hear this carefully. To follow the laws that this fallen institution demands. Not, because, not just because the state exercises the sword... That is, that they can actually wield coercive power to enforce their laws. But because God has granted the state this power. And because this is what God calls us to do. Now, there's a little good news buried in this. You <laughs> Really? In Romans 12, we were reminded as Christians that we are not to take vengeance in our own hands. We are not to use evil means to overcome evil. And so, we're going to love our enemies. But at the same time, God has instituted governments on the earth to be representatives of justice that under God's authority have been given the sword to enact laws. And they're going to do it imperfectly because they are human institutions. But the way that God has set up the world... All of us are, are, 
are geared in some way towards good and all of us benefit when the good happens. And so for the state's own survival, there's a leaning that some of their laws at least will be just and it will help to limit the amount of violence and chaos that there is in society. This state is given then power to try to enact justice and even bring vengeance against evildoers to coerce people away from evil. Now, undoubtedly it is going to do it imperfectly. But they have incentive to maintain relative peace. And we Christians, of all people, should help promote true peace. Follow the laws, pay our taxes, show appropriate honor to those who govern. The message of the Bible is clear. And this is the part where it's like, if you do a care, if you think, if just get, you start getting informed, words of Jesus, these words of Paul, go back through, you start reading through, you will find the affirmation of both government and natural law through Noah and the covenant given to Noah. You, you can go back through Deuteronomy and look at the witness that the, that the people of God are supposed to be and that they're supposed to enact a way of life that holds up goodness and righteousness that will draw people to themselves. When the terrible things happen and it's said that, you know, and if you don't live this way, you're going to be conquered. And then we're told this in Jeremiah 29. Okay, you're in exile. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to settle down in the cities that you live in and I want you to be good citizens. I want you to pray for the rulers. I want you to seek peace in the town. I want you to be a blessing to the people that you live among. Praying and working for the welfare of those who conquered you. And then in the New Testament, we get the words of Jesus. We get the words of Paul in Romans 13. And let me share for you the other great and very clear passage that tells us how we're supposed to live. 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 13. And it will sound exactly like what you're hearing in Paul. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to command those and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slave. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Be good citizens. How do we do this? How do we follow Jesus and live as good citizens of the nations of this world? First, I believe the most important thing is that as we hear this, we really have to claim our identity of who we are in Jesus Christ. Now, I could be wrong, but I think what I'm about to say may be a little controversial. And if it is, it is not because there's any question about what the Bible says. If it's controversial, it's because of the air that we're breathing right now in America. Everything is political. And everything seems to be fracturing around the right and the left. And you know what I'm talking about. Political. And when I say everything is political, I mean that there's real danger for us as followers of Jesus. Because some Christians, I think, and maybe a lot of Christians, are making political allegiance more important than Christian identity. I was talking to another pastor, and he was making an observation, and he said... In all my years of ministry, I have never seen one Christian who left a political party because of their church affiliation. But I've seen plenty of Christians leave a congregation because of their political affiliation. And I was like, yeah, me too. When our politics are more important than the bonds of Christian community, Something is wrong, not just in practice, but in how we understand our call. We need to reclaim our identity in Jesus. You 
and I are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Our ultimate loyalty is not with the country in which we were born or whose passport we carry, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait our Savior, Jesus, to return and complete his work of salvation. He has rescued us from death, from a broken and corrupt world order. Not only are we citizens of heaven, but we've been adopted into the family of God. I want you to consider this. These are the words of Jesus. And if you've never heard these before, they're hard words. And they need a little bit of explanation. I'm going to read them first. This is from Luke 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And when Jesus says this, he's speaking in hyperbole, but he's trying to make the point. Your ultimate allegiance before every other allegiance is to Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be his disciple. He is our God and he comes first. And the commitment to him is greater than blood. Because he's adopting us into his family. And this becomes the bond. Now, this is an argument that's often used in scripture from the lesser to the greater. If you're supposed to be more committed to Jesus Christ and belonging to his family than you are to even your blood relations, how much more should you be committed to his body over any political party? You see, we need to claim our identity. What does it mean to be an ambassador? We have a divine calling to represent our kingdom. And Jesus has made it very clear. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So I want you to go and I want you to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. To bring the gospel to them. To bring the best news ever. World altering, life changing announcement of peace and salvation by the creator of this world. Who has conquered our greatest enemies and will one day purge all this world of sin, death, Satan and evil. This mission is supposed to be the forefront of our minds. How do we make this message known? How do we make this message credible to the world? I'm going to pick on something. Something recent. Don't tune me out. I'm not trying to be political. Mask wearing. How would an ambassador for Jesus Christ think about mask wearing? I've been sent to a foreign country, and they've created a new law, and you're going to have to wear a mask. And I hate wearing masks. Now, before I go much further on this, because I don't really care much about the mask, this is my point. Did you even think about mass mandates through the lens of being an ambassador for Christ? Here's a guess. Many of us probably thought about mask wearing through the perspective and lens of science. That's fine, that's good. Many of us probably thought about it from the perspective of health, personal interest, and safety. It's fine. I'm going to guess, at some point, many of us began thinking about mask wearing politically. But how many of us spent any time thinking about Mass as an ambassador of the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Now, granted, you might have prayed for Jesus to maybe have you move to a place that has a different set of laws than the one that you're presently at. But my point is this. Thinking as an ambassador of Jesus Christ should have been our first thought, not our last And this is exactly how Romans 13 needs to be read. Be good citizens, but you are citizens of heaven representing your king. 
And if you read through this, even before going back to chapter 12, with this whole mindset that he's beginning to turn us outward, and it's not just how you love one another, but you all have a mission, live at peace whenever you can. That, that, that word of Romans 12 flows naturally into Romans 13. We are a call to overcome evil with good and not be overcome by evil. So we're not ever going to use the evil means of these worldly empires. I'm going to work hard to live at peace. That's going to be my focus. Give what is asked. Pay your taxes. Give honor. Observe laws. Always love. Let no debt remain but the continuing debt to love one another. Remember that the call is for the church to be the church. We are not, first of all, individuals, but we are a family. Y'all love, and y'all be a loving community. And you're going to discover who you are, not by yourself as an individual, but who you are in community, because you're the body of Christ and you need each other. And one of the things that is happening is that the church is fracturing under this pressure. But who we are called to be are those who live by God's truth. Sheldon Van Alken wrote in a book called A Severe Mercy these words. The best argument for Christianity is Christians. Their joy, their certainty, their completeness... Always love. Let no debt remain among you except this debt of loving one another. The best argument for Christians is Christianity. They will know that you are my disciples by how you love. How you love one another. And how you love the world. But the strongest argument, Van Alken says, against Christianity is also Christians. When they are somber and joyless, when they are self-righteous and smug and complacent consecration, when they are narrow and repressive, then Christianity dies a thousand deaths. So, we're going to love. And then, and, and just so you know, I'm walking you through all of Romans 13. I haven't read it all for you, but... We talked about love last week, and then we talked about being good citizens, and then he talks about love all over again. And then Paul ends Romans 13 with this, and this is what he basically says. Remember what time it is. You have this call, you're an ambassador, and it's for a certain period of time. And do this, this life that you're now living... This call that you have, understanding the present time. These are the very words of Paul. I'm reading from verse 11. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. How much longer are we going to have to put up with all of this garbage? The Bible says just a little while longer until the full number of brothers and sisters come in. That's our mission. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna carry a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to put up with a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to suffer a whole bunch of stuff so that other people can be saved. Okay, we're supposed to be good citizens. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are ambassadors sent with a mission to make credible and attractive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to submit to the governing authorities that have been placed over us. And I think for many of us, we're, and I, I, I say this too, but, 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 but there's got to be a limit, right? At some point, we just don't submit, right? Now, just so you know, when I think about like these things and this message and stuff, you know, like there's one part where I'm sitting there going, if I don't bring this up earlier, I might lose a whole bunch of people. They're going to be listening to what I say. And the whole one pine, there's going to be this voice in the back of their head. Yeah, but, but, but. There's a limit. There is a place for us to resist. But you know why I waited? 
I waited because of what Jesus teaches us about love. Jesus is training us to love on any kind of love. A love that does not start with demanding rights. We get trained in demanding our rights. And there's a place. We're created in the image of God. There are certain things that should be done. But we as Christians, what we get told is to honor one another above yourselves. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Now, we talked about this last week. It's not because you're less than. It's because you're set free. You have a firm foundation. You are God's beloved. You know the end of the story for you. So you can go and love and you can be treated and people can do evil things towards you. But you know what your marching orders are and that's what's going to define you. But there are limits to submission to the fallen powers and governments of this world. Every ambassador should recognize that there comes a point when we must resist and refuse to follow the fallen powers of this world. Typically, there are three clear lines that Christians have used to mark the point of resistance. The first is the easiest. We always follow God's commands. And we will follow God's commands over and against the human state. The clearest example is in Acts chapter 4 and 5. Where uh, John and Peter get taken before the Sanhedrin because they were preaching the gospel. And they got told, you can't preach the gospel. And you know what they did? They preached the gospel. And then they got taken back in. And they rejoiced for the fact that they were persecuted. This is the easiest because when there's a command from God, you follow the command. And we, even if the state tells us we can't, we will make the gospel known. The state cannot compel us to do evil. We're called to be good citizens. And we will not do evil for the state. No matter what the state tells us to do, you don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't falsify records, you do not knowingly deceive people, you don't tell noble lies. But we also get this warning throughout, but we can't be hypocrites. It can't be that we're we're sometimes committed to the good, but other times when it's convenient for us, we'll do evil. And then finally, there's this. We are held captive by our conscience. But as Christians, what we're talking about is this. The Holy Spirit is with us and lives inside of us. And he wants to lead us. And he will always lead us in conformity to the revealed word of God. But sometimes there's things that the Bible doesn't speak into. And at that point, all you have to go by is what you hear the Holy Spirit telling you to do with a willingness to submit, an openness to listening to scripture, and then an openness of then having brothers and sisters in Christ pray for you and support you. And now I'm going to step in one more thing. Vaccine mandate. I went there. So... There is no scripture that you can point to that says, thou must or must not be vaccinated. You're not going to find it. Now, if somebody has a deeply held conviction, whether to be vaccinated or not to be vaccinated, and they are open to God's word and they listen, all I can tell you is is that I, I... On this one, I'm just going to say, I want you to do what the Holy Spirit calls you to do. I want you to think about it. We can wrestle together. Some of us got vaccinated. Some of us didn't get vaccinated. Maybe this has nothing to do about what God wants us to do or not. I don't know. But I do know this, is that when we break the Christian conscience and we sit there and tell people that that wasn't the Holy Spirit when they thought that it was, and there's nothing in what they did that you can point to Scripture, then we're doing damage to one another. So, some people, out of a matter of conscience, didn't get vaccinated, and some people did. And you know what we should do on that one? We should judge nobody. In our gathered assembly for worship, we are the ecclesia 
of Jesus Christ. Ecclesia is the word that most commonly gets translated church in the New Testament. It literally means called out ones. We are the ones who've been called out of the kingdom of darkness, about the fallen powers of this world, into the glorious kingdom of the Son who loves us and gave his life for us. He has empowered us with the Holy Spirit. He has entrusted us with the keys of the kingdom. The message of the gospel, to go into the world as his ambassadors, to help make credible his call to those who are still the walking dead. Do you think that there will be peace in this world after whatever happens between Russia and the Ukraine? Do you think that the United States can actually save the world? Or science? Or technology? Or capitalism? Or socialism? Or the promise of free sex? Or relativism? Or postmodernism? Or technocrats? Or politicians? The world has not changed that much. There's always some guy on a horse. Ever see the picture of Putin riding a horse? There's always some tyrant itching to expand his kingdom and see human beings who, are, who have been created in the image of God sees them as obstacles, objects to be stomped, smashed, or bombed. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be famines and plagues. There will be persecution and coercive power used against God's people. And there will always be alternative altars built to false gods of power, money, and sex that will demand ultimate allegiance. Gods that will demand that they stamp their identity on you, promise to liberate you, but they will always diminish you. The world needs the church to be the church, to look like Jesus, not just individually, but corporately. And how we live together. One person can be an exception. But when you start seeing hundreds and thousands. And some of them are people that you grew up with. And you're like, I was smarter than that guy in high school. But there's something different in their life. And they have a peace and they have a joy. It's not just that you're an ambassador for Christ. It's not just that I'm an ambassador for Christ. But we as the body of Christ are ambassadors. And so we need to be the church that loves one another. And when it comes to our stance toward the world, we are going to be good citizens. We're going to be good citizens of heaven, which will always mean that ultimately it will be good for the world, even if the world sometimes kills us. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word and your way and your will and this call. And help us in Jesus' name. Amen.